You are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Dahl, writer for USA Today for various SEC-related things, but on this podcast specifically, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. So we were not able to get up a recap of Texas A&M versus Kentucky on yesterday's show. We had a full preview of Auburn versus Kentucky on today's episode. We're going to do, do a little bit of a hodgepodge. We're going to talk about Kentucky versus is Texas A&M here for a minute. Then we're going to talk SEC basketball power rankings that I put together here uh, for you guys. And then to wrap things up, we are going to talk a little bit more Auburn and Kentucky just to give some final thoughts on that. Thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. I want to remind everybody that we are free and available on all podcast platforms. If the voice gives out at any point today, I'm not feeling Again, not feeling too great. Haven't for a few days now. If the voice just gives out, just want you all to know, Kentucky's winning on Saturday. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. Recapping Kentucky versus Texas A&M. I said on the preview show that Severe Wheeler was going to be the MVP of the game. I said that I thought he was going to play very well, not only scoring for himself, but distributing the basketball. And I could not have been more wrong. While he did lead the team in points with 12... Shows you how fun of a game it was. Um, He had eight turnovers. He had eight turnovers to four assists, and those eight turnovers were the worst of his career in a single game. And early on, it was the trap, it was the pressure that Texas A&M was applying to the Wildcats that was really frustrating Severe Wheeler. It's almost like Kentucky had never seen it before. It's like they'd never seen ball pressure, even though they've already played two teams in Tennessee and LSU that really know how to put a strain on your guards. So it was confusing. I also said on the show that it's not like Kentucky's not seen anything like this before in terms of what Texas A&M brings to the table defensively. Uh, Apparently, I was dead wrong on that because Kentucky only scored 64 points. Now, they won the game 64-58, to but it was not um, as much of an offensive explosion that I thought that Kentucky would have had, especially after just scoring 107 points against the second-best team in the country, at least defensively. And so I thought that Severe Wheeler and the guard play was going to be good in this game. It was not great from Severe Wheeler. Uh, We got a relatively poor night from Ty Ty Washington as well. He was 3 of 10 from the field, uh, did not make his one three that he took, was 2 of 4 from the free throw line, which is uncharacteristic. Uh, Had four rebounds, an assist, and a a steal, uh, and only only eight points total uh, for Ty Ty Washington. Kellen Grady, 1 of 9 from 3, 2 of 10 from the floor, only had five points on the day. So Kentucky's three guards did not play well. In this game, and Kentucky really, really struggled to shoot the three ball. Four of 18 from three. That's about 23% uh, from beyond the arc. And this was kind of shaping up, or at least it looked like it was going to shape up, very similar to the way that the Notre Dame-Kentucky game played out. Except what happened in that game is Notre Dame actually shot just a little bit better than Kentucky, and they ended up winning the basketball game. Texas A&M only managed to score 58 points. Now, how did A&M only manage to score 58 points, even though we broke down their metrics and we, we realized this is a really good team efficiency-wise on the offensive end? They shoot a high clip from the floor. They shoot a very high clip from three, best in the SEC. So what happened? Well, we noted that they were the best three-point shooting team in the SEC, not by volume, but by what they actually knocked down by percentage. Texas A&M was one of 22 from three against the Wildcats. One of 22. That's good for 4.5%. 4.5% from three. And that will cost you a game. That will cost you a game. Remember how I said one of my parameters was you have to protect the rim? Well, you also kind of have to protect the three-point line too as well. It's important. Not as important as protecting the rim in my opinion. And Texas A&M just simply couldn't knock down shots. Kentucky was playing well on the defensive end. And at times there were looks. And that A&M just simply couldn't knock it down. Even when they got to the rim, there were looks that they just simply could not put in. Very, very tough day on the offensive end for the Texas A&M Aggies. And look, I think that this Kentucky defense is good. I think they do things well. But there were moments in this game where it's like Kentucky, or excuse me, Texas A&M is just having a cold night. There's cold from the floor. That was just simply what it was, in my opinion. Oscar Sheepway, 
uh, for the second straight game in a row, was a non-factor in a victory, at least scoring the basketball. Only put up five shots, was two of five from the floor, had 14 rebounds and eight points, three steals and three blocks uh, to go along with those numbers. So it wasn't a bad day for Oscar Shibwe. It wasn't a terrible day. It was just underneath his average in terms of you know the, the amount of shots that he normally puts up. Kentucky only shot 58 times in this game, which is weird. It was just an uncharacteristic night. It also, uh, something that was really confusing was the turnovers. Again, eight from Severe Wheeler, 17 total on the day. Had Wheeler not had those eight turners, turnovers, how he had, had he had like four or something, it would have been like, oh, 13, 14 turnovers on the road. Who cares, right? That Like, that's just going to happen against a team that's good defensively. Um so were there, there were some uncharacteristic things that happened in this, in this game that we've not seen uh, for a few games now out of this Kentucky ball club, and it was really discouraging heading into to see that heading into this Auburn game, right? Because I, in my opinion, I think that Kentucky needs to be playing their best brand of basketball to go on the road and beat the number two team in the country. Now, they could do it, and I still think they're going to, but I would have liked to have seen a little bit more momentum. And this was one of those games where it's like, okay, a and put a lot of things on tape. And if Kentucky has their guard play shut down, Auburn's depth could become a huge factor as this game progresses. And we're talking about the game this Saturday, not the game that just happened. So all, all in all, I think it was a great defensive performance from the Wildcats. And then at times it was just a and just cold. Guard play was not good for Kentucky. But they were able to climb out of what was a 13-point deficit twice in the first half. They were able to climb back into this game and eventually steal one on the road. Did not feel like Kentucky deserved to win this game after the way that they played. Um, But Texas A&M just simply couldn't knock down shots. Um, They turned the ball over a little bit themselves. Had 12 turnovers, 18 personal fouls. So it wasn't a great day from the 15-3 and Aggies. All right. That's going to do it for Texas A&M, Kentucky. I wish I could have recapped this game a little bit more in length, but we've got so many other things to talk about today. And we're going to talk about SEC basketball power rankings. Uh, I've got an addition of those for y'all. Would like to kind of continue to do power rankings every single week. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to do it on Monday or do it on Thursday or Friday after games are played. I don't know. I'm just going to have to figure it out. I want to tell you about those power rankings in just a second. But before we do that, I want to tell you guys about our friends at NetSuite. This is it, the putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software. To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth. With visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more, NetSuite is everything you need to grow, and it's all in one place. With NetSuite, you can automate your processes and close your books in no time while staying well ahead of your competition. Over 28,000 businesses already use NetSuite, and for the new year, NetSuite has a new financing program for those ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash locked. Head to netsuite.com slash locked for this special one-of-a-kind financing offer offer on the number one financial system for growing businesses. Again, that's netsuite.com slash locked. All right, SEC basketball power rankings here uh, for you guys. Going to take it from the bottom, work our way up to the top, and just give you an idea of what's going on in the Southeastern Conference. As a Kentucky fan, I think it's our job to stay educated on what's going on in the SEC. We're high-flying right now. We're 15-3, and 5-1. and one. But what's el- what else is going on in the league? What should we be concerned about moving forward? What should we just acknowledge that has happened up until this point? want to stay educated as Kentucky fans. All right. Number 14 in the SEC basketball power rankings. If you follow SEC basketball, you could probably guess this. Number 14 is Georgia. They currently are sitting, I believe, at 5 and 13. They're giving up about 83 points a game or in conference play. And they have just simply fallen off the rails. The fact that Tom Crean still is, is coaching to me is, uh, is surprising. I thought they... We're going to let him go during the offseason, but they're trying to stick it out with him, trying to see if they can turn things around. But this Georgia Bulldogs program is is just simply not in a good spot. But hey, they beat number 18 Memphis. They can hang their hats on that. At number 13, I have Ole Miss. 
Uh, Ole Miss is currently nine and eight, one and four in the SEC. Uh, not playing great basketball right now. They've lost three straight. Lots to uh, Texas A&M. Lost to Auburn at home. Gave Auburn a run for their money, and um, then they lost in, a, in blowout fashion. Uh, a fashion against uh, Missouri. It's so weird that they shot so well against Auburn and for about thirty minutes, uh, and then they just fell apart at home against Missouri. Let me pull up the box score real quick. They shot 34% from the floor and 27% from three. Yeah, that's just simply not going to cut it. Also, the Rebels averaging 61.2 points per game in conference play. At number 12 in the power rankings, I have Missouri. Missouri has been a really interesting team uh, to me this season. They've been up. They've been down. They've beaten uh, semi-decent teams, and then they've just gotten straight up blown out uh, in other in other contests, they are currently eight and nine, two and three overall in the SEC. So they beat Alabama, dropped ninety two points on the Crimson Tide, uh, and then they lost to Arkansas and scored forty three the next game. Then they lost to Texas A and M by three. That was a very close game, sixty four sixty seven. And then they got then they went and on the road blew out Ole Miss. It's so weird just to see the ups and the downs and the ups and the downs from from Missouri. And I'm curious to see if they finish with a record above five hundred. At number 11 in my SEC power ranking, South Carolina, 10 and 7, 1 and 4 in the SEC. Frank, Martin, and Co. have lost three straight against pretty decent opponents. Number 22, Tennessee, at the time uh, they were at home against Florida, lost that game by eight, and then they went on the road and lost by 16 to an Arkansas squad that is on the move right now after starting. Uh, or after there was a stretch early on in the season where they lost like five of six, it was something crazy like that. So number 11, South Carolina. At number 10, I have Vanderbilt 10 and 7, 2 and 3 in conference play. They beat Georgia on the road 73 to 66 and then lost a close, hard fought game to the Volunteers at home. Uh, the Tennessee Volunteers at home 60 to 68 uh, was a really tough loss after keeping that game close for so long. Just uh, in that game, I believe they didn't make their free throws down the stretch, and that's really what came back to haunt them. At number nine, I have Alabama. And some people out there, I'm not going to name them, are still ranking Alabama in their AP poll, poll ballots. I'm just going to say this team was 11 and 6, 12 and 6. I don't think that while they may have played a very difficult strength of schedule, um, losing three straight uh, does not constitute uh, staying in the top 25 at, 10, at 12 and 6. But hey, they beat LSU. They beat LSU, who is sliding right now. Uh, so good for Alabama. At number eight in my SEC basketball power rankings, I have Florida, 11 and six, two and three on the year. Florida is one of those teams where now I think it's just consistently they're going to finish like 19 and 14, 20 and 13, somewhere around there every single year. They're going to be a 10 seed or a seven seed in the in the NCAA tournament. That that's just that's just going to be what they are. They're a first round exit, the round of 32 exit. Uh, that's just simply what they are at this point. They've won two games in a row after starting conference play 0-3. Uh, I'm not surprised. They played three straight-ranked teams, so nothing that Florida could have really done other than just play their hearts out. And they played relatively competitively in all three of those games, but they've just beaten South Carolina and Mississippi State, two relatively uh, decent wins there. At number seven, I have Mississippi State, 12-5, and 3-2 in SEC play. They beat Alabama, and then they went on the road. And lost to Florida. A uh, very lengthy team that the Bulldogs have. Number six, Tennessee, three and three, 12 and five. Lost to Kentucky, as you may know. And then they went on the road and got a close win over the Vanderbilt Commodores. Number five, Arkansas. Uh, this is a team, like I mentioned, that was playing awful. They lost to, o they, this was the stretch. They lost to Oklahoma, lost to Hofstra, uh, beat Elon, lost to Mississippi State, lost to Vanderbilt, lost to Texas A&M. Since that stretch, they've won three straight. They beat Missouri, they beat LSU, and they've beaten South Carolina uh, as of late. That was their most recent game. Number four, LSU, 15-3, and 3-3 and three in the SEC. Now, this is a team that is still not out of the SEC title race, but they're going to have to pick it up. Losing two straight for, uh, for the Tigers was not good. Losing at home to Arkansas and then losing on the road to Alabama, that's just that's really, really tough. At number three, I have Texas A&M. Uh, I think that Texas A&M has a little bit more mental momentum than LSU does right now. Um, Texas A&M, I think, is going, going to be an interesting team to figure out as the schedule progresses because they have an incredibly weak uh, SOS. I believe it's somewhere in the 270s, if I'm not mistaken. 
and they're going to have to play some tough teams. Arkansas, LSU, Tennessee, LSU again, Auburn, Florida, uh, Ole Miss on the road, Alabama, Mississippi State. I mean, they've got some things they, they're going to they're gonna figure out here. At number two, I have Kentucky. And number one, I have Auburn. And these two teams right now are playing the best basketball in the Southeastern Conference, in my opinion. And they play this Saturday. It's going to be a fascinating game to watch. I'm really looking forward to it. Let's go ahead and get to this Kentucky-Auburn preview. Going to talk about what the Wildcats and the Tigers are going to be doing on Saturday. But before we do that, I want to tell you guys about our friends at Bet Bet BetOnline would like to wish you a happy new betting year as we continue our march through the playoffs and beyond. Bet Online remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action for 2022 new year and a new updated desktop and mobile website so you can go over and sign up today to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code locked on to get started. From basketball, football, baseball, hockey, boxing, and UFC right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. BetOnline.ag is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports. BetOnline where the game starts. NFL playoffs heating up, by the way. I'm really excited to see this race conclude. I'm curious to see who the Super Bowl uh, winner is. Curious to see if the Packers actually get over the hump with Aaron Rodgers, but we'll just have to wait and see. And betonline.ag is going to be a fantastic place for all your sports wagering needs. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. I've been holding that itch in my throat for quite some time <laughs> in, during this episode. All right. Auburn. Very good team. 17-1. and one, Just blew out Georgia by 23 points. The Auburn offense, like we cited on yesterday's episode, quick and diverse. They've got a lot of different players that can shoot a lot of different shots from a lot of different places. Scoring over 80, in a, 80 a game. They spread the ball around. Uh, they knock down a decent amount of their threes. They rebound. Uh, they knock down their free throws. Their 18th nationally adjusted efficiency. Very, very good. Three players to look out for, like we mentioned on yesterday's show, Jabari Smith, Wendell Green Jr., Walker Kessler. I'll say this, though, and this is something one of you guys commented, is that Auburn's depth is incredibly important. We talked about that. We talked about how Auburn legitimately plays an 11-man rotation. Their walk-on Leor Berman was part of that 11-man rotation. Like He was getting like 10 minutes a game. Um, he, I don't know if he's going to be ready to go on Saturday. I believe he's hurt. Um, but they'll still be playing like a legitimate 10-man rotation. When they bring in players off the bench, the play does not go down. If anything, the play might go up. Because like I mentioned, Wendell Green Jr. coming off the bench is averaging 13 points a game. And almost five assists a game. Just crazy stuff from the Auburn Tigers from their from a depth perspective. The question that I was asking on yesterday's show, and I think a lot of you agree with me, is Auburn's depth is the biggest factor in this matchup because the Tigers could simply just wear Kentucky down in the second half. They simply could just wear the the Wildcats down. And I think that's a possibility, but I also don't think Kentucky's going to shoot as poorly as they did against A&M. And while I think that Auburn's defense is efficient, we broke down those numbers on yesterday's show. If you want to go check out that, that, um, that episode, I'll leave a link in the description, uh, both on podcast and on YouTube. But it's going to be a very interesting game to watch. Can Auburn slow down Kentucky Tucker like Texas A&M did? And then can Auburn, or can Kentucky slow Auburn's big men down, Jabari Smith and Walker Kessler? It's going to be a very fun matchup. I think it's going to be uh, high-paced. I think this is one of those games where you know fans kind of expect, okay, Kentucky only scored 64. Oh, maybe they're going to score like 70, 72. I think, I think Kentucky cracks 80 in this game. I think Kentucky cracks 80 in this game. Like I said last last game against AM, I'm going to double down. I think Kentucky cracks 80 in this game. I think it's a high-scoring affair. Um, but it's going to be close, and I think Kentucky wins. And I, I, I gave a final score yesterday. I believe 81-7. to seven, No, it was not 81-75. to 75. I forget my final score prediction that I put in. But I will say here, let's go. Let's go. If I'm, if I'm saying we'll crack 80, let's go 83-80. Wildcats by a three. That's my opinion. I think that that Kentucky definitely scores quite a bit in this matchup. And Auburn is not able to sustain the runs that they've had as of late. And Jabari Smith has a cold night. All right, that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Kentucky. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On UK. You can follow me on Twitter at Doll Pound, or excuse me, Lance Doll underscore. I forget that I changed my Twitter handle. 
You can follow the show on Instagram at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, hit me. I want to hear them. I will see you all on Monday. Have a good day and God bless.